Okay, good morning and welcome back everyone to our Tuesday morning market outlook session. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And let's take a look at where markets currently sit for today. Um, before we get started, what we're going to discuss here today is purely for education and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any specific securities. So we'll start off with taking a look at the major equity indices and taking a, and seeing where they currently sit. Uh, let me bring up my annotation so that you can see. Then we'll take a look at the fixed income markets um, before pulling a, a look at the commodity markets. We've seen some substantial moves here from the commodity markets. We'll take a look at where they currently sit and how we expect uh, some commodities to react. Uh, we'll take a look at the sector rotation model, give you a better sense for which sectors are strengthening here in this type of weakness that we're starting to see within equities. We'll take a look at some of the economic indicators around inflation and wage growth and before we show you some of our ideas here for today. So uh, the primary question that I think investors have been asking here over the past few days have largely been around whether we believe that the weakness we've seen in equities over the past few weeks, you know, is that the start of perhaps a larger pullback here? That's the question that every investor wants to try to answer in the current uh, market environment. So before we get started, so, you know, my name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And I want to share with you my technical research, the charts that help inform my decisions as to the potential market outlook that we're currently in. So looking at the S&P 500, we do have a fairly, I would say, weak picture because uh, this 422, 422 uh, level that we saw back here in early May, despite an attempt to break out above that last week, has really failed. And now we've come back to retest this level now as potentially as resistance. So this is looking more and more like a, a sideways market rather than a potential continuation of that breakout higher. We need to see a sustained move above 422 and a sustained move above 426 or so, which is now the new all-time high. If we can break out above both of those levels, then we can look at a continuation higher here for equities. But until that happens, this is really much more of a sideways market. I would consider this recent breakout here up here as a bit of a false breakout here. So really what we've seen is a sideways market pretty much since the beginning of April here or so. And the question is really how far this is going to last. And, you know, as, as long as we remain in this range bound market, uh, you know, levels all the way down to 404 uh, or so, which is also corresponds with roughly the 200 day moving average. Those are potential ranges that the S and P 500 could potentially trade in here. So, uh, you know, the S&P 500 is certainly not looking as strong here. When we look at the NASDAQ 100, this is looking stronger than the S&P 500 because it has at least held this 342 resistance level now as the new support level as this breakout. The question similar to the S&P 500 is, can this uh, move higher sustain itself? There are some concerns that as we see higher highs in price here in the weekly chart on QQQ, the NASDAQ 100 index, as you can see, momentum is showing signs of exhaustion. So uh, we're seeing higher highs in price, no longer being confirmed by higher highs in momentum. So this certainly leads to more of a, of a higher probability of a consolidation and a pullback here. And when we look at the NASDAQ 100, you have 328 as a support around the 200 day moving average. And you still have this 316 low that we put in back here in early May as potential targets here to the downside if we do see a sustained pullback here in the broader equity market. So when we look on balance here for equities, Things are not particularly strong for a continuation higher here, but the NASDAQ does look a little stronger here than the S&P 500. When we look across the board, the, uh, the IWM, Russell 2000 Index, very much still in its range bound uh, that it's been in since basically February. Uh, you have a high around three, uh, 232 or so, uh, a low around two, uh, 210 or so, and you're just very much range bound here. The 200-day moving average so far has held as support here, so that is a potential for a breakout, but we'll have to see, but you need to see a sustained breakout above 232 or so in order for this to continue moving higher. 
Uh, but the one thing that really is worrying for me is looking at the RSP, the equal weight S&P 500 index. This really helped confirm that that breakout we saw in the S&P 500 last, last week or, or the week before was largely a bit of a false breakout here because it was just a few of the major market cap uh, stocks dragging the markets higher above those all-time highs. But the broader uh, S&P 500, all the fi constituents of the 500 names, if you look at them from an equal weight perspective, did not break out higher and is actually now substantially weaker here than the S&P 500 market cap indices. So this is showing us that market breadth here is actually narrowing, that when you have growth sectors like uh, consumer discretionary, consumer um, uh, technology, when those are the ones, when those are the sectors uh, moving higher and the rest of the markets are not, this is showing narrowing breadth here. And this is something that we're starting to see here emerge in the equity markets. This is not particularly strong or this is not what you typically see at the breakout here to new all-time highs. Also, the percentage of stocks trading above its 50-day moving average sits at about 50%. You want to see much higher numbers for a continuation higher here, like what we saw back here in November and December, where we were in the 80s when we started to break out significantly higher in the broader markets. But as you can see, that has continued to actually weaken here over the past few months. So the percentage of stocks trading above its 50-day moving average right now is also not particularly constructive of, uh, of equity markets breaking out to new all-time highs. So when we then flip over to the fixed income markets, this is really what's interesting for me is the fact that despite equity, uh, I'm sorry, yields coming down substantially over the past couple of weeks, even despite the Fed's announcement that they're going to likely raise interest rates in 2023 and start thinking about tapering uh, their bond purchases, which we expect to get more information on the, uh, during the September meeting, Despite that announcement, we're starting to, we still continue to see yields uh, decline here, meaning people are buying uh, at treasury bonds, uh, decreasing these yields. And yet, despite in that type of environment, equities are not breaking out to new all-time highs. Um, you know, that for me is a further evidence that equity markets are not particularly strong here at the moment. And this also puts at risk that if yields start to rise, which I think a lot of investors still see that, you know, the, the Fed has been clear in, to, in terms of their message that they're going to likely raise interest rates a little quicker than what than the market has anticipated, that they were going to start thinking about, uh, they're going to start talking about um, uh, pulling back on asset purchases in terms of bonds. This is going to have an, an effect of raising interest rates. And there's also the, the current debate that's still uh, up in the air as to whether the inflationary numbers we're seeing are transitory or permanent. If we see more a permanent shift towards inflation numbers, that's also going to drive interest rates higher here. So there's a fair amount of risk that we could see a climb here in interest rates due to uh, you know the Fed policy and inflation. And largely, that's going to be a net negative here for equities. So there is both fundamental and technical you know, exposure here, in my opinion, to where equity markets are currently sitting. So as you, as you ask the question, you know, are we at risk of a bigger pullback here in equities? There certainly ha there, we certainly have some of the um, building blocks towards that. That's not to say that's going to happen, but you know, some of the things that we're starting to see emerge are potentially going to lead to that. And then when we look at some of the commodities, so first I'm going to take a look at Bitcoin, just because we're at a fairly pivotal level here. This is the 30,000 level. Now I'm going to draw a couple of lines that I think are important. The 20,000 level, which had, which really goes back to the 2017 highs. This was the pre-breakout level here, testing the $20,000 level multiple times throughout November before having a very quick breakout from 20,000 to 30,000 in about a month's time in December of 2020. And then after breaking back out above the $30,000 $30, level, it tested it multiple times as support and constructed what I would consider a bit of a left shoulder here. You have this major topping formation, which you could call a bit of a head. And then recently after bouncing all the way down to the $30,000 level multiple times off this level, we formed what looks like a right shoulder here. 
Now, we are just back at this pivotal level here at 30,000. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to break below 30,000. This very well could remain range bound here for some time before it can potentially break. But as you can see, you have this giant kind of vacuum here between 20,000 and 30,000 that really, you know, there's not a lot of trading in between that. So this is really where we are at risk that if we see a break below 30,000, Bitcoin could very well, uh, you know, settle back down to 20,000 fairly quickly. So Bitcoin at a fairly pivotal level here to pay attention to. And this is really kind of a bit of a resolution to all of this negative divergence that we continue to talk about here at Bit, um, in terms of Bitcoin and just the negative momentum and, and exhaustion that we continue to see here in Bitcoin. So looking at other commodities, gold. Gold also saw a substantial decline here on the Fed meeting here last week, but it did manage to to hold this 166 support level. So going back to the weekly chart here, this is a support level that held multiple times before it broke down below this level, came back to break out above that level, and is now coming back to test this level as support. So far, we are seeing a holding a hold of this level here. If we do break down below this level, this certainly puts 155, 156 here to the downside as potential targets to the downside. And then when we look at crude, we start to see some uh, massive negative divergence uh, uh, here on crude as we make higher highs in price, uh, but we are seeing exhaustion here. Higher and higher in price, not being confirmed by higher highs in uh, momentum, both on the daily and weekly chart here. So crude also at risk of a potential pullback here. And then when we take a look at sector rotation, so when we see when we when we're looking at an equity market and we're trying to ascertain whether we can we see the construction of of um, a continuation higher, usually a healthy market rally will see a fair amount of rotation meaning it's not just one or two sectors or just a few sectors continuing to move higher while most of the other sectors or some of the other sectors continue to move lower. You want to see a healthy amount of rotation, right? And when you look at a sector rotation chart, it's a very good way to visually see, are there a bunch of sectors moving in this particular direction while you see a bunch of sectors moving in this particular direction? And when you look at sector rotation over the past few weeks, now this has gone on for almost four weeks now. We've been warning investors that, you know, a lack of rotation is not healthy for a market rally. And we said that, you know, two weeks in, three weeks in, not too big of a deal. As you start getting into four weeks in, a month in, that's when it starts to look a little bit unhealthy. And we don't see a lot of sector rotation here at the, at the moment. We do have a couple of sectors that have some rotation here, both consumer discretionary and healthcare. We have seen real estate and energy come down a little bit, but otherwise you really see Technology continue to move in the leading category. Staples, industrials, materials, and financials continuing to be lagging. So not a lot of rotation here in the broader markets. This is not particularly healthy for the market in the current, in the current market conditions. So we really continue to monitor this to see where there are uh, strengthening sectors, where there are weakening sectors, because that's going to help you identify potential opportunities in this market. Right now, technology remaining in the leading category, the only one in the leading category, you do have uh, both healthcare and discretionary very close to leading. That's one that we're going to pay attention to here today. Industrials seemingly is starting to turn, turn higher a little bit. Same thing with materials. Not quite there yet, but uh, certainly seemingly like the earning early innings of potentially what could be turning up to improving. And then we really have real estate, energy, communications that is starting to fall back into the weakening category. So a little bit of rotation starting to happen. Utilities also uh, kind of failing to continuing to move towards the leading category here. So when we dive into the individual sectors, a few that I want to point out here. Uh, first one is consumer discretionary. Now, What's interesting about the price pattern here for consumer discretionary is that you have what looks like a forming of a, a head and shoulders pattern, which typically would be more of a bearish pattern. But as you can see, consumer discretionary remains one of the stronger sectors and is at and is potentially about to break out higher here towards that higher level here, the head. Now, 
this is this is what we would call a failed head and shoulders pattern and head failed head and shoulders patterns generally speaking are a fairly bullish pattern here so a continuation higher here above this 174 dollar level would bring likely that 180 level here to the upside so consumer discretionary certainly one sector worth paying attention to another sector is cons is technology technology is at uh you know the verge of potentially a double top breakout here a double top breakout is also fairly Bear, bullish pattern here. Um, it hasn't broken out yet, but we want to see this breakout above 144. If we do see that breakout above 144, that certainly is a fairly bullish pattern here for technology. And lastly, consumer, I'm sorry, healthcare, very similar pattern here to uh, technology in terms of, you know, finding a bit of a base here over the past couple of months after uh, consolidating um, after what has been a pretty strong move here to the upside from about 110 or so up to 122, consolidated for quite some time and is now on the verge of a potential breakout here as well. So, you know, those are three sectors that if you're looking for long opportunities are potentially setting up or at least looking much stronger here as the uh, versus the other sectors. So when we take a look at uh, uh, you know, some of the economic indicators. This is really where we continue to monitor, uh, you know, some of the underlying indicators with respect to inflation. And one of the things that we really want to pay attention to here is wage uh, or l labor costs. Um, we continue to see labor costs grow substantially here, largely in, uh, you know, hospitality um, and leisure, retail, um, but also, you know, some of the other sectors are seeing some substantial growth in terms of wage uh, growth. Now, wage growth is at a lower pace is generally good for the um for everyone, if you will, for purchasing power, but the sustained wage growth here is going to be a concern. And the question is whether this is transitory or permanent. And the two things that I do think what we need to think about here that leads us to believe that this could be a little bit more permanent than uh, than what the Fed is currently saying really comes down to you know why there's a labor shortage, right? There's certainly the labor shortage that's due to um, uh, a substantial increase in childcare and the fact that not everyone has uh, the ability to go back to work because they can't find affordable childcare. You also have lower income. Um, uh, you, ha you have someone on the lower income side that is still receiving unemployment that perhaps is uh, actually has an increase in terms of income due to unemployment. And that's not due to uh, taper off until September. So you have that shortage of labor potentially from there. And those largely would likely be more transitory. However, when you look at some of the other reasons that we have a labor shortage, we had a significant increase in early retirement at the beginning of the pandemic. Now, those are people that are unlikely to come back to work. So this is more of a permanent loss, if you will, of about 1.2 million workers here in the U.S. So not a huge percentage, but uh, still a substantial amount of, of experienced workers that have left the workforce um, and that are not coming back. And then you compound that with the fact that we're not replacing uh, these workers with uh, immigration. Um, immigration remains at a very uh, low levels compared to pre-pandemic levels. We're talking about just about 22, 23% of immigration relative to pre-pandemic levels. That's going to cause us another labor shortage. That's going to take much more, that's going to take a little bit more time to resolve itself here in the uh, current market conditions. So these are some of the things that I think we really need to be concerned about or, or, or aware of of in terms of, you know, when we think about whether inflation is transitory or permanent is to understand underlying where that shortage is coming from and how quickly are those types of things uh, going to resolve itself. From my perspective, the, the early retirement, the lack of immigration, that's going to take a little longer to resolve itself than just a couple of months versus, you know, uh, resolving some of the childcare as things reopen and, and unemployment tapers off in September, that's going to resolve itself relatively quickly. So it's kind of a um, you know, it's not black and white here. It's kind of a mixed bag here in terms of labor shortages. Um, and then when you look at pricing power and you look at the supply 
shocks, right? Because these are the two things that the Fed has talked about in terms of their belief that this is more transitory. They really talked about wage and they talked about um, supply shocks. And they basically suggested that these supply shocks that we're seeing in the markets are, tra- are temporary. They're going to resolve themselves. Uh, so one of the things that we really have to pay attention to is really some of the uh, retailer numbers, the ISM numbers, the PMI numbers. These are the ones, these are the economic indicators that's going to tell us whether these supply shocks are easing, if you will. So so far, we have not seen that. We continue to see these economic indicators surprise here to the upside. ISI retailers' pricing power uh, has continued to rise here. Um, as you can see, this is a fairly steep move that we have really have not seen uh, since 2004 or so. And, and even then, it wasn't this particular steep. So this is something that we need to continue to monitor, see how much are the supply constraints in the market affecting consumers in terms of uh, the, the, the cost of the, of the consumer goods that we have to pay for, uh, you know, for these supply shocks. So right now, these things have not eased yet. So these are the things that we'll continue to monitor as we continue to have this debate as to whether this is transitory or more permanent. In my opinion, I think that the markets are perhaps uh, shifting a little bit too far in one direction to say that things are very transitory. Um, but I think that it's likely going to lie somewhere in the middle between those two um, extremes. So when we look for opportunities here in this broader market, uh, you know, like we highlighted consumer discretionary, we highlighted healthcare and technology. So let's take a look at some of the ideas that we see within this particular space. Uh, first one I want to bring up here is Home Depot. And I want to bring up Home Depot simply because housing, despite the weakness we've seen here from housing stocks and housing, uh, you know, some of the, um, decline in mortgage applications, design, decline in housing starts, uh, the increase in lumber that caused some of that, uh, I would say, supply shock, if you will, um, those things have largely eased off. And you had stocks like Home Depot that is largely a beneficiary of this uh, substantial increase we've seen towards housing stocks, you know, uh, has seen a significant decline here from the breakout level here. This is the March breakout level around 290, reached all the way about to oh, just shy of 350 or so, but it's pulled all the way back here to the 200 day moving average and just yesterday bounced off that level. So I do think that we are now um, perhaps uh, finished this uh, correction here, which is roughly about a third of the correction and has the opportunity of continuing uh, of continuing to move higher. This is a stock that trades at a fairly, um, it, it is on the expensive side from a multiples perspective, but it has contracted quite a bit here over the past uh, month or so. It remains one of the strongest um, uh, stocks in the market here at the moment. So this is really why uh, when you look at the consumer discretionary sector, Home Depot screens relatively well. Uh, on the real estate side, we continue to see real estate be one of the strongest sectors here in the current market. And Crown Castle, interesting uh, REITs play uh, because Crown Castle largely is um, um, leasing uh, cell phone towers. And we think about 5G rollouts here. This is really one of the uh, main beneficiaries of that from the retail sector. And I think within retail, you really have to be very fine. You really have to be very focused in terms of what sec- what subsectors of retail do you want to, f- I'm sorry, of real estate do you want to focus on here? Um, and Crown Castle is certainly one of the t- more technology focused plays within retail. You have data centers, you have, uh, you know, um, uh, cell phone leasing, you have uh, logistics in terms of e-commerce warehouse. Those are some of the uh, subsectors within real estate that look very strong here at the moment. So Crown Castle, despite the weakness here we've seen in equities over the past month, continues to break out higher here. And as you can see here, a breakout higher here so far are still being confirmed by momentum. So we're not seeing exhaustion here as we're seeing in some of the other sectors. So this is really one that I uh, quite like for a continuation higher here or has a, a higher probability of a potential breakout. And lastly, within healthcare, healthcare also remains one of our strongest um, sectors. United Healthcare, after breaking out above this $380 level, has pulled back almost all the way back to this level and is now back towards its 21-day moving average. This one is still not quite there yet. I'd like to see a breakout above that 21-day moving average for this to continue moving higher here. As you can see, this pullback has got the RSI pulled all the way back to the 30 level um, and really has the potential, in my opinion, of continuing higher here as it reached a bit of a more oversold level 
and is uh, looking for a potential bounce. So with that, that covers what I wanted to share with you here today. I hope that this was helpful in giving you a better understanding as to how you want to view the markets. Like I said, things are not particularly strong for, you, for a breakout. The underlying indicators, the market breadth, and the percentage of stocks trading above its 50-day moving average, the sector rotation, these are not uh, you know, very encouraging signs, in my opinion, of a substantial breakout here. I think you're more likely to see more range bound markets. So you really have to be far more selective in terms of the stocks that you select in this type of market. With that, thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great trading day and I'll see you guys here next week.